Thank you all for this opportunity. As uh, you mentioned, I am relatively new to UAB. I've been here just over a year, but I'm very excited to share with you my passion for global health and nephrology. Um, I'm going to share some stories, but also some data and some of the research that I've been working on and that we hope to translate here at UAB with UAB's partners in Zambia. <clears throat> um, and really, uh, in part, upon if, if there are your learners out there, why it's important in global health to also look at the other half of the disease burden, not just infectious diseases. Um, Non-communicable diseases are um, becoming more and more responsible for larger portions of, of death worldwide. Um, and it's potentially going to even worsen with COVID as we know COVID is affecting those with chronic conditions. So those disparities could, could be exacerbated. Uh, just one quick disclaimer is that uh, some of the studies I will talk about did use a non-FDA approved diagnostic test known as NGAL. Uh, the company that makes that test did donate it for the study, but that was their only involvement in the study. And so I apologize if you came to learn only about acute kidney injury. I, I felt that it wouldn't do it justice to not talk about chronic kidney disease and how they interact, but then I will focus mostly on acute kidney injury and talk about those novel tests. And then hopefully where we're hoping to take this here um, with UAB and in Zambia. So before I jump into some of the data, I'm gonna be presenting a number of patient stories uh, and that I have met, encountered over my, my years working in Africa and, and specifically in Malawi. So some background, Malawi is one of the five poorest countries in the world. It's located in Southeast uh, Africa. Kamuzu Central Hospital is in the capital city of Lilongwe. It's one of three primary referral centers for the country. It has the largest number of surgeons. At the time I was working there, it had the only nephrologist. Uh, and, and I say nephrologist in, in the broad sense. This uh, clinician completed his intern year, his first year of medical training after medical school. And that was it. That is the majority of medical training. People do one year after medical school and then they're licensed to be general medical doctors. But this um, gentleman has been kind of by, by practice um, is, is the nephrologist there. Um, very recently, I think within the past six months or so, there is now an adult nephrologist in another city. But for the longest time, past 30 years, he's been the only working nephrologist in the country. Um, to give you a sense of that, the Kamuzu Central Hospital, where I worked in the central region, covers a population of 5 million people. So it's about the same size as Alabama. Um, and again, one nephrologist for an entire size of Alabama. And the conditions can become quite crowded. This is a picture of the um, outpatient medical center. And as you can see, quite crowded. Inpatient is just as crowded. On the right here is a picture of a dialysis machine. Um, if you've never seen a dialysis machine, you might not know how to compare this. This is quite uh, outdated, um, but still very functional, and it's what they use. Um, but essentially what is happening with dialysis when you go into kidney failure, your kidneys aren't cleaning your blood anymore. They're not getting rid of excess fluid. So blood is taken out and it goes through this filter here, cleans your blood and puts the blood back into the body. That is a very simplified version of what happens. The machine there does all of the intricate um, titrations that are necessary. And so um, what can happen though, if you have chronic kidney failure, this is, this is it for, for you in Africa. If you have chronic kidney failure in the United States, your hope is to use this as a bridge to get you to transplant. But in Malawi, there are no transplants in the country. So if you have chronic kidney failure, this is, this is it, and it's kind of a palliative care, more or less. And that's really the way it is for large portions of Africa. Um, and at one point, this dialysis center in, in Malawi was able to offer chronic dialysis for up to 80 patients, which was a lot. But again, this is for a population of 5 million people. If we compare it to Alabama, I uh, just quickly looked up today, Alabama has 12,000 people on chronic dialysis right now. For a nation like Malawi, it has triple the population of Alabama. And at best, this center could provide 80 chronic patients with dialysis. The other centers at best could provide 20 or 30. 
So we're talking many orders of magnitude less care that is able to be provided. <clears throat> so the first cases I want to talk about are two such chronic kidney failure patients. The first is a 26 year old who had chronic kidney failure. It was presumed because he had uncontrolled hypertension for years and he was initiated on dialysis in 2015. And the other is a 39 year old who also had chronic kidney failure and it was presumed multiple reasons. She had hypertension for 12 years. She was known to be HIV positive for at least six years and on therapy for five years. All can be risk factors for chronic kidney disease. And then in 2017, the hospital ran out of all prepared home dialysis fluids. Both of these patients, there's different modalities for giving dialysis. One is that machine that I just showed you where you take the blood out, clean it, and put it back in. The other is called a home therapy where you actually put dialysis fluid into the belly. The peritoneum of the abdomen cleans the blood and the excess waste and fluid comes out when you drain the abdomen. And that's called peritoneal dialysis or home dialysis. And so these two patients had had chronic kidney failure for a while. And so their blood vessels were scarred down and they couldn't do the blood or hemodialysis option. So their only option to survive was to do home peritoneal dialysis. But in 2017, the hospital ran out of all of their home prepared dialysis fluid. So they had to rely on donated fluid or expired fluid. They managed to scrounge up a few extra bags from other hospitals, um, some private clinics. Um, but unfortunately by April, so four or five months later, the entire country was out of any home dialysis fluid, expired or not expired, they were out. And so what do you do? We've got these two patients here. And so, <clears throat> what I wanna talk about first before I jump to the conclusion of those stories is a little background on the global burden of chronic kidney disease. Um, this was a meta-analysis that shows the prevalence of chronic kidney disease worldwide. And the graph is giving the CKD prevalence estimated by the large number of studies by patient's age. Each dot represents one study's prevalence estimate, and the larger the size, the worse the precision of that estimate. Um, but a difficulty with a lot of these global estimates of chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury is that the di diagnosis relies on serum creatinine, which requires a functioning laboratory. In Malawi, at that main hospital I work at, at best, you can get lab tests a couple times a week. Um, typically, it takes almost three to five days to get a lab result back. Some of those chronic patients are only able to get blood tests done once every six months or once a year, whereas if these patients were in the U.S., we'd be getting them every week. And so overall, this meta-analysis found that there was a global prevalence of chronic kidney disease of almost 14%. And they found several risk factors common in the U.S., like diabetes and age to be associated with chronic kidney disease. Interestingly, they did not find obesity to be associated with chronic kidney disease, though we have seen in US studies that it is a risk factor. This review in The Lancet tried to assess global differences based on the different types of dialysis that are provided and the different access. But for a country to be represented in this analysis, they had to have a national registry. An estimate suggests that more than 2 million people worldwide have end-stage kidney disease or chronic kidney failure, and a large portion never have access to dialysis. But again, this review is mostly representing high-income or middle-income countries because half of the world's population did not have national registries, including most of Africa, all of India, uh, and mainland China. The figure over here is the blue represents patients who get transplanted. Uh, we consider transplant to be a kind of um, end point for chronic kidney failure. Yellow is those who are receiving hemodialysis in center. So that big machine I showed you, you have to come into a, a clinic to receive that therapy. And then the gray bars are the ones who are receiving home peritoneal dialysis. And you can see that um, Hong Kong and New Zealand and Mexico are really leading the way in home therapies. And here's the US where the majority of our care is provided in in-center hemodialysis. And that's really left for another discussion about why that's the case. Um, and then Europe is represented here, the various countries throughout Europe, and they are leading the way in transplants. 
<clears throat> the International Society of Nephrology tried to get at with their global kidney health atlas why it is that these lower income countries are suffering that way. They estimated that there's actually almost 10 million people who need kidney replacement therapy or dialysis. However, this orange is the number of people who need dialysis but can't get it. The blue is the people who need it and receive dialysis. So only a quarter of the people who need dialysis are able to receive it. And again, we expect these disparities to worsen over time. Um, they predicted it to worsen by 2030. Uh, my personal prediction is this might even worsen further with COVID causing further disparities. Um, this figure on the right helps explain where some of those disparities lie. If you're a high income country and you need dialysis, 60% of people who need it are able to get it. They hypothesize that this 40% who don't get it in high income countries are either those who are um, very elderly and refuse it. They, they decline to, to accept it. Dialysis is not an easy lifestyle. Um, and so some people just choose not to, to get it. But if you lived in Malawi or Zambia, over here in low income, only 4% of people who need dialysis are able to access it. So back to our two cases, you've got two chronic patients who require dialysis to survive and you're completely out of home dialysis fluid. So what do you do? Um, I mentioned a little briefly, but the home dialysis takes dialysis fluid, puts it into your abdomen, cleans your blood, and then you drain it out. But you need that specially made dialysis fluid. Well, the great thing is these clinicians that I work with over there ha have great ideas and, and we were able to help transfer some of those ideas and ingenuity and save these two patients' lives. Um, the head dialysis nurse, Maya, here in the middle, and the um, head nursing officer, Chisomo, were able to figure out some connections to take regular IV fluid bags, so your regular uh, fluid bags that would rehydrate somebody, and connect them to the peritoneal dialysis um, connectors in the patient's abdomen. And then myself and Dr. Montali, the working nephrologist there, translated some international guidelines to make up homemade dialysis fluid out of regular IV fluids. And thankfully, um, we were able to help these patients come into the hospital and get this concoction of homemade fluid for eight weeks. Um, that was how long the country had no commercially available dialysis fluid. And both patients survived that eight week ordeal. Um, one is, is alive and doing well today. Unfortunately, a couple months after this um, event, uh, one of the patients did, did die from infection complications, but we were able to show the government as well that it's possible even in their setting, if fluid shortages occur to, to get, get over that barrier. Um, these are the guidelines that we use to help us. They, they do suggest um, how to make one certain kind of uh, dialysis fluid. I won't go into these details, um, but essentially we took those guidelines, created our own table for what we had available and made our own fluid. Um, I'm gonna jump now um, to talking about another case and briefly explain why I spent that time talking about chronic kidney disease and its impact over on the healthcare system. And that's because we're learning in nephrology that multiple episodes of kidney injury or acute kidney injury can lead to chronic kidney disease over time. Every time you have an episode of AKI, you have a scar build up in your kidney. And that scar may be small, it may be large, we don't know. Time, time tells how that long that lasts. Um, but it's hypothesized that repeated episodes of AKI or acute kidney injury are what are contributing partly to the rising cases of chronic kidney failure globally, particularly in low resource settings. And so this next case I'm gonna share is about a 37 year old mother. Um, she has four children and she was walking to the local market to get her, her groceries for the day. And she was unfortunately struck by a motor vehicle. She was rushed to the emergency room at the hospital, but she had severely crushed legs and likely abdominal injuries. In the 12 hours after arrival overnight, she received two liters of fluid. To keep in mind, your blood volume is about five liters, your total blood volume. So she received two liters. Um, in the US, she might have received probably 10 to 14 liters of fluid. 
she initially had a creatinine of 2.3 and a potassium of 7.9, and she was making urine. Um, and now keep in mind, I know, don't know how many nephrologists we have out there, but a normal creatinine is one or less probably for a, uh, a woman of her age. And the potassium really should be less than five. Uh, if your potassium is above 6.5, that is when we get concerned about sudden cardiac death. And so keep in mind, this is a setting where the only reason she got blood tests is because she was involved in our study. Otherwise, trauma patients in Malawi would not routinely have gotten kidney function tests. They would rely on whether or not a patient is making urine over the past couple of days. So the clinicians there would never have suspected kidney injury because she was making urine. There are international guidelines, which I present here, called the KDIGO guidelines, that give us definitions for what defines acute kidney injury. And what I will highlight is that a creatinine bump of even 0 0.3, 0 0.3, is acute kidney injury. And so if hers was 2.3, we don't know what her baseline is. This is one of the limitations of this international guideline, um, is most patients in Africa do not have a known baseline value. But we can assume she was otherwise healthy and her baseline was somewhere between 0 0.8 and 1. <clears throat> Um, and this baseline issue is another area of research of mine. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it today, but if you are interested, I'm more than happy to talk with you um, offline about that. All right, so let's just talk about um, AKI before we conclude her story. And we're just really beginning to scratch the surface of this problem globally. A large portion of this burden is really felt in low income settings, Mo but most of our data on diagnostics and management and uh, long-term complications comes from high-income settings. Uh, the Europe and, in Europe and the U.S., we know that AKI increases mortality. Um, it ranges, but AKI in any disease process can increase mortality 10 to 30 percent. However, estimates in low-income countries suggest that AKI is even worse, and mortality can be increased 70 to 100 percent if you develop AKI in a low-income setting. And so, that also suggests that breakthrough in diagnostics or management may have an even greater impact in low income settings. There's a very rough estimate that 13 million people annually are affected by acute kidney injury. And the majority, as I said, is occurring in low income settings. And so this translates to about 36,000 new cases of AKI daily, which is about seven times greater than the rate of new HIV cases daily. And however, remember these estimates are based on creatinine tests, which um, makes them relied on systems that have robust laboratory capacities. And so that's why I say that these really are very rough estimates because if your country or your nation or your region doesn't have robust lab laboratory capacity, it's really hard to know what the true burden is. And so remember that the 37 year old woman never would have had a kidney function test done had she not been in our study. The clinicians, based on their experience and their practice, never would have assumed or uh, thought about kidney injury in her because she was making urine. And the same could be said for chronic kidney disease estimates as well. <clears throat> and so smaller studies that have tried to look at the global AKI burden have shown that low resource settings, even though they might have a higher burden, are really showing similar reasons or causes for AKI as high income settings. Infections are a common cause, but in low resource settings, you'll see more malaria and HIV as the driver. Nephrotoxins are, are a common cause across the area, but in hospitals in low income settings, they're not able to monitor drug levels, such as for vancomycin or gentamicin. And so we don't know uh, how much of that is contributing to AKI. There's also more use of herbal remedies in low resource settings. And so we don't have really great characterizations of those herbal remedies to know how much of them are or are not nephrotoxic. Fluid loss is a similar cause across the world, but in low resource settings, there's almost no, some places there's almost no pre-hospital care where you're getting IV fluids on your way to the hospital. And if you don't get enough fluids, you have decreased blood flow to your kidneys and that causes more kidney damage. And then um, there are higher rates of trauma in low resource settings. The other uh, category that's not on here, and again, could be a whole nother conversation, is we're seeing COVID causes a high rate of kidney injury. Um, and that's across the board. We have not, I have not seen that um, 
represented for low resource settings, but I have no reason to suspect COVID uh, wouldn't cause um, high rates of AKI in low resource settings as well. Um, but this is really where my story started a few years ago when I was starting out my PhD work at UNC and trying to figure out where I could help work fill in these large gaps of knowledge. And I really was pretty lucky and found myself in a situation in Malawi where they had a trauma registry in place. And I had lived there already for a year during medical school doing research in another area. And so working with colleagues at UNC in trauma surgery and the School of Public Health and our colleagues, uh, Malawian surgeons there, we um, were able to get a grant from the International Society of Nephrology and we were able to look at exploring the epidemiology of trauma-related AKI in this setting. Um, there are much, much higher rates of trauma in, in Africa and other low resource settings. And as you can see, road safety is a major concern. Um, trauma is the leading cause of mortality for children and young adults worldwide. And if any of you have traveled uh, through some of these lower resource settings, you, you can appreciate that. One of my fears when I traveled to Africa is not about getting malaria. It's about being in a, a motor vehicle accident. Because uh, some of these areas you really do not know what might be crossing the road. So trauma is the leading killer of uh, children and young adults worldwide. And we know that AKI is a complication of trauma, but there's very little literature out there on trauma-related AKI. These are just a handful of the studies I could find um, out there on trauma-related AKI. They're primarily in adults. They're primarily in critically ill patients. And these top two here um, in South Africa at the time were the only two studies in Africa that looked at trauma-related AKI. <clears throat> and so that was really where my interest got peaked and we started looking at fig figuring out what, why that's the case or wh what else we could learn from trauma-related AKI. And so our aim was really to look at what is the incidence of AKI in trauma patients in Malawi. And we wanted to look at it in both adult and pediatric patients. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we did have to cut our studies short a little bit and we weren't able to get as many pediatric patients as we had wanted but we still had more than 200 adults and more than 100 children to, to analyze. And so just as a quick reminder, one problem we realized early on in our analyses is that the standard accepted for defining AKI relies on this baseline creatinine. Um, but there is no standard for defining baseline creatinine in children worldwide. Um, there is one for adults in the international guidelines but none of them are based on African populations um, and certainly none in pediatric African populations. And so part of my study does look at what, are there better definitions or formulas we should use for this estimation? Um, just very briefly here, we looked at this data and based on the child's height here on the x-axis, uh, we looked at what was their creatinine on the, the y-axis. These red and green dots are what common formulas are used. These formulas are used to estimate a baseline creatinine, but these formulas were derived in healthy children with chronic kidney disease, or I should say stable children, children in the outpatient world with chronic kidney disease is where these formulas were derived from. No one has derived formulas for adults or children who are hospitalized and you wanna look back at what their baseline creatinine should be. These blue dots are what we took to be the lowest creatinine value for the patients during their hospitalization. And so these really are the least biased, but do require multiple lab values. And so we looked at this to try to figure out which formula worked best for this population. And it, the, the, the definition matters because depending on which definition you use, you have a different uh, incidence of AKI. But we found it averaged between five to 10%. My suspicion based on other analyses we did is that AKI in this population is probably close to 10%. Um, and now this was a small study. We only had 100 children, so we only had 11 cases of AKI, but we're submitting grants now to do a much larger study in Zambia to also look at that, um, uh, the same question. But we did also find that if the children had AKI, they were almost a six and a half times increased risk of, develop, of, of mortality than those who did not develop AKI. 
And the same was true in our adult population. But we also looked at, there's different risk factors for AKI development in Malawi compared to other high income settings. And so we wanted to explore those. And we found that looking at a variety of potential risk factors, burn injuries were as expected, a higher risk of developing AKI. People who had multiple injuries or truncal injuries, meaning that the core of the body, the, the chest or the abdomen, were at a higher risk of AKI. And interestingly, if the child had received herbal remedies in the previous seven days before admission, they had a six times likelier chance of developing AKI than those who didn't receive herbal remedies. Um, this is an interesting fact. We weren't fully expecting it to have this big of an effect. Um, and so really interested in exploring this further, though it's going to get tricky um, because half of the patients who took herbal remedies couldn't remember what they had given the child. They just referred to it as an herbal remedy. Um, so definitely a lot to explore there. We're still analyzing the data, but we did a similar uh, analysis for adults. Um, and we can see that the formulas in green and red do not match up with the blue dots, which are the lowest creatinine values. Those lowest creatinine values are the, the least biased of all of the creatinine estimates. And again, depending on what definition you use, that AKI incidence varies from 12 to 17%. So I'm going to uh, switch gears from talking about the incidence of AKI to saying, okay, if we say there's a high incidence of AKI in trauma patients, how can we help in this situation? Um, creatinine is the current gold standard for diagnosing it. It's expensive. It's only available at tertiary centers. It's, there's, there's like no hope to get it if you're out in a district hospital. How, how can we diagnose it better? So AKI is a complex um, disease process. This model here tries to simplify it. Um, it takes here the normal kidney is in yellow. There are those who have an increased risk for developing AKI. So our epidemiology helps us with this population. And then some insult happens, whether that be trauma, fluid loss, or an infection, and you start to get damage. That damage goes on and it lowers your kidney function or your GFR is another term for kidney function. So the damage causes a drop in your kidney function until it reaches a certain point here where your creatinine finally starts to change. So it takes a while up until this point where you've had a lot of damage going on and you've lost kidney function until you see a creatinine change such that you can actually diagnose kidney injury. And then it goes on further until kidney failure. And until you implement, um, until you recognize it and then implement um, mitigation strategies, it will keep going on to, to death ultimately if you do not address it. Um, if you are able to recognize it and, and mitigate the complications quicker, you can reverse that kidney failure if it is acute. And so, um, but there are several novel biomarkers that I'm going to talk about today. One is NGAL, where it rises when damage has occurred, so much sooner than when you see creatinine changes. NGAL has been shown in both adults and children to consistently predict subsequent AKI diagnosis. NGAL is a protein that's released from damaged kidney tubules um, within just a couple of hours of damage. There are other biomarkers out there. The FDA has approved uh, a biomarker uh, dipstick known as uh, Nefrocheck. Um, as well, and that's primarily been used in adults, whereas NGAL has primarily been studied in children. And the study I did at, in Malawi that I'm going to talk about today is using NGAL. Um, but we, like I said, we've got new grants out that we're hoping to look at NGAL and Nefrochak and compare them. And so there's been a lot of research and investment in high income settings to evaluate and use these new biomarkers. High income countries like the United States, we currently use creatinine as a routine standard for diagnosing AKI. So this is where we're currently diagnosing AKI. But there's a lot of momentum and uh, throughout Europe and some US pediatric centers, they're using NGAL to diagnose AKI. So they've moved their recognition back here. Um, adults uh, centers in the US, some are using Nefrocheck, which has also, again, moved the, moved the pendulum back towards damage. But in low-income countries like Malawi and Zambia, this is where they're diagnosing AKI right now because they're waiting until the kidney has gotten so bad that 
someone has stopped making urine for two to three days. But so in, in these situations, where does NGAL or these other fancy biomarkers fit in? Well, the company who developed NGAL actually has created a dipstick that would not require lab technicians or electricity. And so it's possible that if we capitalize on the momentum of biomarker research in high income settings and this dipstick and move that to low income settings, and we could help low income countries diagnose AKI back here, we have a lot of potential to make some dramatic improvements in mortality and patients' lives in Africa and other low resource settings. So as I mentioned, there's a couple different dipsticks out there. Our study in Malawi was on NGAL, um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about here, but more than happy to talk offline about some of the other dipsticks that are out there. NGAL is a protein that's released from kidney tubules. And like I said, it's released within a couple of hours. Creatinine can take one to three days before you see a rise after damage has occurred. The lab-based test of NGAL has been thoroughly tested and repeatedly shown in both adults and children to uh, predict subsequent kidney injury. Um, however, the lab-based NGAL requires a lab. It requires the same machines that a, a creatinine test does, and it's not super cheap. It's not very expensive. It's $30 to $40 on average, but not very cheap for these settings. The dipstick, on the other hand, um, this was the first prototype of it. it was able to be unrefrigerated for a month at room temperature. The dipstick at the time was about $3 per dipstick or less. They think they're actually going to be able to make it cheaper than that. And um, they're increasing the shelf life for the dipstick so that it can stay on the shelves for hopefully six months or a year without requiring refrigeration. And so if this is successful, you can imagine it can really reach a lot of places that are suffering from kidney injury and don't realize it because they can't test for it. And so what our study in Malawi showed was we did both the lab test and the dipstick test, and they had pretty good correlation. Um, the lab, this was both in adults and children, and we showed that the correlation was greater than 70%. And we compared, uh, we, lo we looked at this correlation in both adults and children and found similar results. The clinical performance of the dipstick was similar to lab-based tests. Um, the specificity and the negative predictive values were very good above 70 or 80 percent, which means we think it could be a really useful tool for screening out AKI. The sensitivity of the dipstick was, uh, was much poorer than what we have seen for the lab-based test. The lab-based tests show sensitivities closer to 80 percent. We didn't see that for the dipstick, but um, again, we only had about 35 patients total who developed AKI. So we also think we were a little underpowered for this diagnosis, uh, for this evaluating this dipstick. Common thresholds used in the literature have a dipstick or have an NGAL threshold of 150 or 300. And so that's what we kind of looked at for our study. And again, it seems to be very promising to screen out AKI, um, maybe not so good to rule in disease. But again, we don't expect NGAL to replace creatinine in the US either. It is going to be an additional tool uh, for looking at when injury has occurred and for recognizing it maybe a little sooner in addition to creatinine. And so I would imagine the same would be true for Malawi or Zambia. This isn't going to replace creatinine, but perhaps out in a district hospital where you have to decide which of 10 patients in the trauma need to get on the bus to go to the hospital and only one patient gets to go, maybe this helps you decide which patient is sicker, which patient needs to get there and get further testing for their kidney function. And then the other thing that we found in, in, on those same veins is that people who tested positive with a dipstick first, so this middle section here, those who tested positive with the dipstick first and then developed AKI, had a much higher risk of mortality, particularly in children. So this blue bar is children who tested positive with a dipstick and then developed AKI. They had a 12 times higher risk of mortality than those, who, than those children who did not develop AKI. And so um, we're hopeful, and again, our, our, hopefully we'll get our grants funded and we'll be looking at the NGAL dipstick, but also the other dipsticks that are out there, the Nefrocheck and there's a saliva dipstick as screening tools in trauma patients in Zambia. 
And so what happened to that mother of four um, who was unfortunately struck by a car? Uh, and unfortunately, despite her severe kidney injury, which was likely related to a crush injury and that high potassium, she unfortunately passed away the, the day after arrival. The surgical team who I talked with later were actually astonished to learn that she had such severe kidney injury because their, their um, uh, clinical understanding in that setting is that if you're making urine, your kidneys are working okay. And so there's still also a lot of clinical education that's needed that we've got to also check the lab test because urine um, doesn't always mean your kidneys are okay. And so in addition to lab resource shortages, there's a large clinical education gap um, and it does take a lot of staff and support for full nephrology care across the spectrum. And it's not depicted here in this uh, uh, assessment by the International Society of Nephrology, but I would also argue that epidemiologists are in short supply looking at nephrology care because many countries don't have a registry, just a simple national registry to say, what is their burden? And those are really uh, vital for learning which uh, populations are at high risk for it. Where can they target their therapies and their resources that are so limited? And so the ISN has estimated that for standard nephrology care, the world faces extreme shortages in nephrologists, but all of the support staff. And in particular, they estimate that the world needs to double their laboratory technicians to be able to provide sufficient nephrology care. So what if a dipstick could be validated and used instead, or in addition to it? Perhaps we could uh, decrease the demand for laboratory technicians. And so we have clinical training partnerships we're working to develop with Zambia in addition to our research uh, portfolio. And hopefully we'll be able to um, help, help build some of that clinical capacity that these countries are, that Zambia is needing. And so in summary, um, AKI or acute kidney injury is a major global health problem that has been drastically overlooked. Trauma-related AKI is poorly studied, but it may affect 10 to 15% of children and adults in Malawi and perhaps other African settings. We need more studies to look at that. And that trauma-related AKI drastically increases the risk of mortality, maybe three to seven times as much as those who don't develop AKI. And then new dipsticks such as NGAL and perhaps others could revolutionize our understanding and our clinical care of AKI in low resource settings um, in Africa, but for perhaps beyond, perhaps post-disaster settings, conflict zones, and perhaps other AKI-related problems. So sepsis causes AKI, malaria causes AKI. It's possible these dipsticks could be used in other diseases that are at high risk for causing AKI. And so it's gonna take a lot of teamwork, both locally and globally, but I do believe we can make strides to improving and decreasing these disparities in nephrology worldwide. And it's not gonna be easy, but it does work, uh, start by working with together and working on collaborations of our local partners to recognize these burdens and then work towards reducing them.